Due to strong patriarchal content, viewer discretion is advised. The greatest threat to modern democracy is not the uneducated masses and not the stupid voters. The greatest threat is the elites themselves, the professionals, the managers, the lawyers, academics, journalists, bankers, all the technocrats whose job it is to tell everyone else how to live their life. They are highly educated, yet separate from the real world, a privileged class floating in a world of abstract information. They have private schools, private physicians, private security. They no longer have contact with the common man, and all too often, they no longer have a Christian morality. Some may claim to be Christian, but their true religion is egalitarianism. This is a Gnostic faith. It's an absolute belief that everyone must be equal, that massive state power must be used to eliminate inequality in all of its forms. They want to eliminate racism and sexism and elitism and capitalism and theism. They want to put the ban on everything that creates excellence and hierarchy and order among men. The most efficient way of doing this is to get rid of the men, or failing that, at least politically neutralize the men, emasculate them, by accusing them of sexism. One organization in this agenda is called the American Psychological Association. Forty years ago, the APA was male-dominated. About 80% of psychologists were men, but now in the schools the men are down to 25%. Three quarters of the new graduates are women. And this is a problem. Not because they care about men, they don't. It's a problem because the women care about their own money and power and prestige. And those factors are only found when a profession is male dominated. In 1995, the APA mobilized a task force to look into this problem. Their report analyzed the field and found that a process of feminization was already well underway. Men were losing interest and in choosing other fields, which means more women are hired, which means less money and prestige for psychologists, which means even more men lose interest. It's a vicious circle, which had already been seen in other professions. The question for the egalitarians was, how can we blame men for this? In 1996, psychologists created the theory of ambivalent sexism, which expands the traditional definition of sexism to include benevolence. Male benevolence is defined as the affection, idealization, and protection of feminine women. Male benevolence is directed at females who are feminine and submissive, which is bad because modern women aspire to be masculine and dominant. So for egalitarians, this benevolence is problematic because it preserves traditional sex roles and patriarchal social structures. They defined benevolent sexism as a construct with three subcomponents. The first subcomponent is protective paternalism, which religion calls chivalry, the idea that women need to be loved, cherished, and protected. Egalitarians find this problematic because it supports the patriarchy, it presupposes male dominance. The second subcomponent is gender differentiation, which religion calls complementarianism. This is the idea that women have positive traits that men lack, such as empathy, and that men need women to fulfill certain roles, such as wife and mother. Now, complementarianism is not a bug, it's a feature of all patriarchal religions. They all believe that men and women have different roles, different responsibilities, and that this difference balances out, and that it's why the sexes need each other. Egalitarians deny this. They believe that the sexes are perfectly equal and fungible, and that everyone can be autonomous. The third subcomponent is heterosexuality, which religion calls heterosexuality. This is the idea that both men and women are attracted to each other and need each other, that they need love and romance and intimacy from the opposite sex in order to feel complete. Egalitarians find this problematic because it ignores alternative sexualities and because heterosexual relationships increase the risk of violence against women. Now this is true, but Left unsaid is the fact that homosexual relationships have an even greater risk of violence, but why let facts get in the way of a good theory? 
They're on a roll here. They've defined their construct in such a way that anyone who dares distinguish between a good girl and a slut is a sexist. The only question is, how sexist are they? For this, the psychologists introduce a new measure, the ambivalent sexism inventory, an instrument designed to label as many people sexist as possible. If you believe that women and children should be rescued first, then they've got you. You too are a sexist. And that includes most women. Females are sexist too, and that is an intended feature of this system. They find female sexism everywhere, and that suggests that it's not just some primal male need to dominate women, though there may be such a need. No, it suggests that sexism is socially constructed. It's culturally transmitted. It's everywhere. And that means a bigger agenda and greater funding for the social engineers. In 2006, Kevin Spencer finished a thesis on how sexist ideologies are perpetuated through social practices. Or in English, he studied why the hot college girls preferred to sleep with sexist men. How can this be? What can the social engineers do to stop this? Turns out that one reason for this was a desire to get married. Another reason for this was that they held religious beliefs. And here he admits that egalitarians are mostly godless. But the most surprising reason was that females just don't have the cognitive ability to recognize sexism when they see it. They fail to identify etiquette and chivalry as sexist behaviors, and they don't realize this benevolence is oppressive until the feminists tell them. In 2008, a psychologist finished a dissertation on how sexism affects relationship quality and sexual satisfaction. She found that it has no effect on either. Sexism does not harm relationships, and the sexist men make just as good lovers as egalitarian men. This was true even in the case of hostile sexism, when the relationship was with a male chauvinist. And that may be because the woman chose their men precisely because of their dominant attitude. But whatever the reason, male dominance didn't hurt the relationship. The one thing that did harm relationship quality was when the female was struggling with perceived sexism in the greater world. Her recommendation to counselors is that they help women to struggle more against the greater world, because that's what people need, more feminism. In 2009, psychologists studied whether men are simply afraid of powerful women. They found that no, the male motivation is not fear, it's rather a strong attraction to feminine women. Benevolent sexism was found to be linked to greater motivation to have a long-term relationship and to stronger belief in love and romance and to a greater willingness to invest in a family. The more femininity a woman was perceived to have, the more the men increased their relational striving to gain her affection. Normal people call this process romance. But these are psychologists, and according to them, traditional romance reinforces the status quo and maintains gender inequality. In 2007, three psychologists found that benevolent sexism harms female cognitive performance. Part of benevolent sexism is the idea that men are responsible for taking care of women, and apparently this idea is devastating. This male benevolence creates in the female a mindset of preoccupation and other mental intrusions that weaken her ability to concentrate. Because of this effect, they concluded that explicit, hostile, and blatant sexism may be more useful to the cause of feminism, because any benevolence would weaken her performance. In 2009, six psychologists studied the various effects that sexist male engineers have on young female engineers. What exactly are these mental intrusions that harm the female ability to concentrate? They experimented with a popular leftist theory called stereotype threat, which is a kind of social identity threat. The first experiment determined what behaviors distinguish a sexist male from the more preferred egalitarian male. They isolated two factors. The first is a dominant and confident attitude. The second is a sexual interest in the female. Put these two together and you get an operational definition of benevolent sexism. 
The second experiment found that female performance on engineering tests is indeed directly related to the amount of sexism emanated by the male. They speculated that his sexism was reducing her performance by making her angry. The third experiment found that no, this was not true. She was not offended by the sexism. In fact, all it was doing was making her feel attracted to the sexist male. The fourth experiment dug deeper into female test scores and found that the presence of a sexist male only hurts math performance. It actually helps performance in English. Which was odd because the female subjects were engineering students, not English majors. The male sexism was improving their skill in an area they had had no training in. They also found that the sexism had made the females feel more positive about the testing process. And as before, it made them feel more attracted to the male. So now they speculate that math performance is hurt because the females are feeling degraded and objectified. The fifth and final experiment tested this and found that no, they don't feel objectified. In fact, females actually felt less self-conscious and more confident in themselves in the presence of the sexist male. And they discovered that male sexism actually increased the female motivation to do well on the test, possibly a subconscious desire to please the male. And they did do well on the test, but only on subjects other than math. So to summarize, the psychologists found that sexism does not offend the young female engineer, sexism increases female attraction to the male, it increases female satisfaction with the academic testing process, it increases female confidence and self-assurance, it increases female desire to do well on tests, and it helps bring out feminine gifts that no one knew she had. Therefore, and you can see this coming, Therefore, sexism is terrible for young female engineers. Sexist attitudes create a threatening and unwelcoming environment that undermines women's ability to succeed in math and engineering. Yes, it's all men's fault. The patriarchy must be destroyed. Now, they could have said that male minds simply find it easier to concentrate on math, or they could have said that females are only good at math when there are no males around who are interested in them. They could have said that, but no one would have published it. So they said what they had to say. They said that female engineers, those poor young female engineers, are, are victims. They're being held down, oppressed by global, omnipresent, insidious environment of benevolent sexism enabled and perpetuated by those sexist males and their romantic interest in geeky girls, especially in elevators. Yes, gentlemen, in the next video, Rebecca Watson versus the world. So until the next video, comment, rate, subscribe, and thank you for your patience.